Hello and welcome to Unsupervised Thinking, a podcast on neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and science more broadly. We are a group of computational neuroscientists. I'm Grace. I'm Josh. I'm Alex. And I'm Jan. All four of us. And the topic for this episode is studying behavior in light of evolution. So for this, we read a recent paper that is called Resynthesizing Behavior Through Phylogenetic Refinement, and that's by Paul Chisek from 2019. And this paper came to us through many routes. People were recommended it. Uh, a Twitter user by the name How Does It Work recommended it to me. Um, and so in addition to reading that paper, we also read a paper that that paper cites, which is called Intelligence Without Representation. That's by Rodney Brooks in the journal Artificial Intelligence from 1991. Though I did notice that it said it was submitted to the journal in 1987. So that's a large gap four years between submission and, and publication. Um, yeah, we're probably going to focus more on the first paper, which is speaking more directly about the brain, but they're both making similar points, which basically the overall thesis here is that to understand how complex behavior can arise, it makes sense to look at how simple sim systems that are functional in their own right could evolve as they do in the natural world, or for the second paper, it's an artificial intelligence approach, so it's more about engineering. But the idea that you build simple systems or you have simple systems that work on their own right to solve problems in their environment, and then you can add on to those simple systems to get more complex systems, but the adding on is contingent on the state before. So those are kind of similarities that are in both of those papers. One is a way to study the brain because it came through evolution. And in the second paper, it's a way to build uh, robotic systems that will function better uh, through this approach. And I guess another theme is this idea that uh, it's better to study whole behaviors from beginning to end rather than chunking things up into kind of input computation and output uh, the way that is kind of frequently done in cognitive neuroscience and also in more traditional artificial intelligence. So they're advocating for this more holistic approach where it's kind of uh, top to bottom, you're studying a single behavior, how that behavior influences the whole system. So maybe we can get into the first paper and what maybe they set up as the state of things now that they're kind of going against. Yeah, so a, a theme that I, I guess comes up in a lot of uh, the work by Paul Chisek is this idea that people tend to separate for the purpose of studying things, cognition or intelligent behavior into first perception and then sort of some internal processes like cognition, which might include things like planning in order to act. Um, and while that separation might be useful for, for breaking down problems uh, in a way that feels accessible to, to, to a certain kind of science, it's not clear that that's actually a productive way of really separating problems where, where, you, where you have a, a solid grounding after the fact. So the first thing that gets laid out in this, in this paper is a sort of taxonomy of concepts that maybe a cognitive scientist or a neuroscience, a neuroscientist informed by psychology and cognitive science might think of as the way to break down the, the kinds of behaviors that animals engage in, animals or humans engage in. And uh, so he, he's, he, in his, the three major categories here are basically perception, cognition, and action. Uh, the, his point will be that these are not separate or, or separable at all, really, but that you should be thinking of them in a, in a kind of combined way for the purposes of behavior. But the, the sort of first view that he's, he's laying out is this separation between these, these three categories. And this is similar to uh, what, I mean, uh, we won't always draw these parallels immediately, but Rodney Brooks was uh, kind of comparing, I think, against some other ideas in the, in the, the robotics literature around the same time of, of sort of having robots that do like a sense, plan, act kind of separation. Um, and that is kind of the same idea. And it, it makes sense because cognitive scientists and psychologists would kind of naturally break down a lot of behavior into these separable components. And so either cognitive scientists or roboticists might say, well, I'm going to focus on perception. I'm going to study how uh, an artificial system or an animal uh, 
perceives things and represents them as as the problem that I care about. But um, the the sort of the thesis here will be that you shouldn't really be doing that. You should you should think about the holistic thing and and build systems which kind of have perception all the way through to action as as some sort of you know behavior generating um, ab ability and cognition is some cognition and the idea of sort of representing the sensory world or preparing action like in the in the sense of planning are things that might happen kind of implicitly in the middle but it's not clear that we should expect them to happen super explicitly and do you guys think that this is like a fair representation of what neuroscience and cognitive scientists are doing i thought moment? so in this breakdown of like how cognitive scientists approach it um, he breaks down these three major categories into subcategories and cognition includes things like attention and language and memory and and then in perception there's multiple you know senses and all of these things and I felt that that was a somewhat accurate like those are the words that are used <laughs> he has a figure with yeah. a tree that breaks this down and those are words that are used and if you ask someone what they study they might say I study vision I study uh, memory or whatever um, and I I do think that those words are bad. We don't use them well or precisely. So in that way, it did seem true that this is how we break things down. And there is a problem associated with that. Like this isn't an optimal breakdown for the system. I also thought it was interesting because he, and I think this is, is relevant, is this is a, kind of a plea to change the framework. And he talks about, you know, half of science is not just answering questions, it's asking the right questions. And this idea that we inherit questions from the scientists who came before us, which in the paper he describes as people who know less than us. <laughs> so we're like taking their word that they've carved out the question yeah. space correctly and this is how we should frame our problems, when in reality it does make sense to check in every now and then and be like, oh, is this approach actually serving us or should we change up the framework in a way that aligns more, mm -hmm. in this case kind of with the, the root of the biology uh, that comes through in the evolutionary tree. I don't really think anyone would disagree with what he's saying. Yeah. I think the problem is more that it seems, uh, I mean, the idea that evolution is incremental, and so you have to take into account the context of, I don't know, the previous uh, like lineage in terms of how behavior evolves. And I think it's fair that people have been focusing on these three different classes of behavior uh, because it does seem like they can in some senses be distinguished and are like kind of clustered in a sense. Um, but I think what's really special about this paper is his uh, example that he uses that really tries to get into the details that I guess we can talk about a little bit later. But I thought that to be very valuable. Like the, he so he walks like, through kind of the evolution of sensory motor behavior. Is exactly, that what you're with about? like the approach avoidance example. Yeah, so we'll yeah. get into that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think we should talk about, because he talks about this before getting into the actual history, um, the concept of representations and this idea of do you need to explicitly represent things. This is also obviously in the second paper, because the title of that is Intelligence Without Representations. So he brings this up a bit in the the intro um, to this first paper. And I think my main takeaway, both from this paper and that, is like, I just don't know what people mean by the word representation, <laughs> or everyone has such different meanings that I don't know if this is a fair description of what people believe. He's basically saying that, like, there's a, the, the theme in both the papers is kind of people are too caught up in the concept of explicit representations, like, the, the world is represented in neural activity somewhere and that's not the way to go because really you should just think about it as like a system that's producing behavior and receiving feedback. Um, so what do you guys think about the talk about representations? I agree with that, actually, as someone who studies representations in my work. What? You mean the criticism of it? or the, I, I agree with the, the idea that people are caught up with representations. Um, part of that is because they're, I mean, it's useful to basically it's correlating like external variables with neural activity yeah. uh, and that's useful for I mean areas that we know very little about and in some ways I mean I don't know I feel like it everyone has to I don't know maybe you can tell me if I'm wrong I feel like everyone must agree that it's not like the representation that's the important thing like the nervous system the goal of it is not to make a representation of the external world that is as faithful as possible um, of course the goal is to produce some type of behavior that's more likely to result in creating offspring like that's the evolutionary goal and I think that 
no one really disagrees with that. And, and I guess that's what I was trying to get to before with the, it's more like the difficulty of how do you really incorporate that evolutionary framework yeah. into it? So, yeah, I mean, like you said, I think, uh, I doubt many of us or, you know, many people would actively disagree with this criticism of representation, but the problem is that we still keep using it in our research and, uh, we, we, we have, you know, we, we assume, oh, like we want to build a faithful representation or we want to like build a, a model which faithfully represents the stimuli that the brain is seeing. And we're going to like test how well it does by decoding the brain activity to see how well it represents the stimuli. And, and so I think, you know, before I heard this criticism and I, I, like I did this kind of stuff, right. And you, know, you hear this criticism, and you're like, okay, yeah, what else can we do really? But I think what I like about this is that it actually does provide some sort of guidance as well, or examples of maybe where you should be careful about it and what you can actually do, basically. I, um, I don't want to go off topic too much, but I think that there are examples of um, work that use kind of this idea of representation in a way that's not just like purely correlational, like Murdad Jezayeri has some nice work. And I think Larry Abbott does, uh, also has um, some similar work uh, where they show that like the they make predictions about the type of thalamic input that should be coming into motor cortex in order to generate these types of representations that they see in the data, um, which that's like a kind of a step beyond, right? I don't know. I think this representational view is still useful, but it's, uh, I think it's important to think of it as a metaphor and try to like extend more into like the more dynamic type of view. Yeah. But I think it is the case that the definitions vary wildly. Like, oh, yeah, for sure. Some people think representation means like faithful, 100% accurate recreation of the world in the brain. Whereas it see, I feel like people have thought for a long time that obviously the brain isn't representing the world like verbatim. It's processing it in a way that's useful. And to say that the representations that you find of, say, the visual world in the brain are processed in a way that's useful to the animal that's doing it that is in line with the view that they're putting in here because they're saying that you know you should look at this as a process and the way that you take in input is going to be dependent on what output you're trying to do with it so it seems like you can like the the, re the definition of representation that i'm familiar with or that i have kind of inherently like gotten through osmosis of the literature that i read because it isn't usually explicitly defined but that i would say is not um, against the views that are being put here. It's, so it's just a difference in definition. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for some people, they might be taking more of a sort of symbolic processing kind of connotation when they talk about representation. They might mean like symbol, symbol manipulation, uh, which I think also is not really maybe what I've inherited as the kind of canonical definition. In some sense, deep learning often is like referred to as representation learning. And that's a very black boxy thing where the idea is you don't provide representations, you provide raw inputs. And in the context of something like deep reinforcement learning, you produce actions directly by learning something that goes from raw inputs to actions. And it does that via learning inter various intermediate representations, which are not explicitly anything. They're just the sort of learned representations yeah. that facilitate the transformation from raw inputs into actions. So I think that usage of representation, I mean, I don't know what kind of uh, sort of rhetoric maybe Rodney Brooks would engage in around this, but I think the spirit of what he was trying to do with the behaviorally uh, based robotics, I, I think has to be consistent with the use of deep learning, despite the fact that in his paper, he explicitly says, this is not connectionism yeah. and this is not neural networks. <laughs> um, it, it just seems to me that like, if you're learning how to make robots work from raw inputs and produce actions in the context of tasks using something like deep reinforcement learning, I'm not sure how that could be really meaningfully inconsistent with this sort of main message. But well, that's kind of... I think maybe when you're talking about deep, re deep reinforcement learning, that's like maybe a, a case where it aligns best with what Ronnie Brooks is talking about. But when, when, you, when you think of most deep learning, it's just like, you know, you know training a classifier for object recognition like a CNN. But even to have that specific task in mind when you train it means that the representations that you're learning are specific to that problem. So anytime yeah. there's a particular problem that the input is being used to solve, you're going to learn to transform it in a way that is good for that problem. I think it is the case, though, because in the, the AI paper, he when he's talking about representations, he makes reference to the idea of tokens. 
which I think is pretty clear that he has like an older sense of representation because this was written in like 87 or whatever it was written um, because tokens are more like like they're kind of like one hot embeddings. It's like right. if yeah. this is on, it means that there is a chair in the environment. So like, yeah, that's not what we mean by representations. We don't mean one to one easy like binary variables that tell you what's present or like what your internal state is or something. So it does seem like he had a different definition. And, and that definition was this sort of classical AI view of the brain or an AI system ought to have an explicit representation of perhaps the external world or sort of semantically meaningful things kind of in isolated ways, which I think conventionally neuroscientists have also believed, right? Like, I mean, so, so neuroscientists sometimes will look for neurons that respond in a sort of totally interpretable way to uh, something that's a stimulus, right? I mean, I think more recently, neuroscientists obviously have been open to the idea of of things like mixed selectivity has become a big idea, but just generally the idea that neurons will not be interpretable like in an easy way that aligns perfectly with task variables. But that feels like something that's come about over the last few years, at least as a dominant mainstream view within computational or systems neuroscience. Uh, the other comment that came up in the AI paper was that... Um, if you build a system the way he says, where it can do things just by kind of layering different behaviors, um, if there are representations, it's kind of only in the eye of the beholder that that there, these things would be called representations. And that to me, that gets kind of to the point yeah. of people having such different thoughts about it, because to me, it's like, obviously, it's only in the eye of the beholder. Like, this is a tool that we're using to understand what the brain is doing. I'm correlating things with the outside world. I'm correlating them with other parts of the brain. Like, yeah, this is my tool. So, of course, like firing rates are only in the eye of the beholder. Like, that's yeah. a kind of extrapolation from the actual physical thing that's happening. So I think that's another kind of component to the confusion or the quote-unquote disagreement, which is just that, yes, it's a tool that humans use to understand a system. That's what representations are. Okay, should we actually talk about evolution and uh, this paper about the brain? So, I mean, to summarize the actual thesis, because we kind of got at the intro, uh, except for what Alex was hinting at, the sort of main thesis of the paper is that uh, in trying to understand what the brain does, one line of reasoning that we can use to sort of form theories about what the brain is doing comes from evolutionary history. Um, so specifically the idea that we can look at the contexts in which different nervous systems evolved and we can look at the transitions that occurred, so the developments in the course of evolution, in order to support new behavior uh, as, and, as well as like the computations that are required to produce those new behaviors. So when looking, when trying to understand like, well, what does this brain region do? Or how does an animal produce this kind of behavior? We should look at the animals that preceded it and the kind of behavior they could produce and the changes that occurred in the course of evolution and how those changes are likely to allow for the changes uh, in the resulting computations that support the new behaviors that the, the, the subsequent animals, in, in this case, more complicated animals can actually now produce. And I think there was a like a second theme that's related, which is um, the idea of looking at um, behavior more like generally as an extension of a type of homeostatic control, which is very, um, very intuitive for like simple sensor motor kind of computations that are done by very simple organisms. But then even like making a path um, through the phylogenetic tree towards more complex like social behaviors and viewing those as also potentially homeostatic. Yeah, so in particular, it's uh, the concept of negative feedback control. So in that, you can think of a situation where like there, he talks about, uh, you know, very simple organisms where if they're hungry and there's no food around, they move. And the idea is that by moving, you go to a place where there is food and then that gets rid of this uh, problem that you had of hunger. So it's it's dampening down the problem so then you don't move. So it's not like a positive feedback loop. You'd keep reinforcing the, the thing that you're starting with and it would get bigger and bigger. This is you're responding to, he uses the word impetus as the thing that, that makes you go. And you are responding to that with a behavior that shuts it down. And what I like about this view is that then as you go up the phylogenetic tree, organisms evolve the ability to increasingly use their behavior to um, modify the 
environment or modify themselves with respect to the environment uh, in order to, uh, I don't know, get more nutrients or something. Uh, and so if you think about it this way, this kind of takes away a lot of the magic of like the of cognitive functions. Like they're uh, just things that kind of evolved naturally in order to enable an organism to exert more control over its environment. And so even in the context of like social behaviors, if you can predict with high accuracy um, what other, I don't know, conspecifics are going to do um, in a particular situation, if you act a particular way, um, then you can also view that as yourself uh, in acti- like controlling yeah. the environment. So I, I agree with, with most of what you're saying, but I think uh, a subtlety that's worth keeping in mind is maybe the paradigmatic case might not initially be that you can predict what a conspecific can do, but simply that you kind of have some association whereby you recognize that your behavior modulates their behavior towards you. So like uh, the example might be like a baby crying, right? It cries in order to get its parents to do something, which is like partly innate. And then partly it kind of learns that it can cry to get certain consequences, which you can view kind of as being like maybe it, is able to predict that its crying will have some consequence, but it could simply be a sort of more model-free, like, I cry and something happens that's good in response to that when I cry this way in this situation, so I do that. That's fair. I was thinking more of, like, evolution predicts uh, in a teleological sense. But, yeah, I agree with you. So another example, which um, I can was instructive for me anyway in terms of how this kind of encourages different ways of thinking about how to like model neuroscience systems is um the the sort of idea of um basically aversion and approaching food are two different sort of types of behavior um that if you're looking at it from a sort of from a different point of view you might look at an animal with this behavior and be like okay there's like you know and there's a circuit that creates movements and sometimes it um is aversive to a stimuli and sometimes it um, like, a stim- like a stimulus because there's food and it moves towards it. And so you have to think about like, okay, how does this decision-making circuit know how to classify whether it's aversive or whether it's uh, food? And then you have to think about how this decision happens and how like this creates this movement. Um, whereas the, sort of the, the, the framework proposed here is that actually these are two very different sort of evolved behaviors that actually have different circuits. And this is obviously, you know, this is known in neuroscience anyway. Like if you look at parts in the mouse brain or something or the... You know that flight, like aversive, aversive behavior and um, behavior which goes towards the stimulus uses different circuits. But for me as a modeler, I always find this kind of like frustrating as opposed to like illuminating basically. And having this framework in mind makes it easier to think about how to, how to approach understanding these systems basically. Yeah, I would say throughout, I kind of like when I was learning about different elements of evolution, because I would say most neuroscientists, and I think he says this in the paper, like they don't know about evolution. And I think that's fair. Like if you're studying particular species, you don't start your talk with like the evolutionary tree where that species is, because that's not going to help anybody understand anything because we don't know about evolution. Although, I mean, I guess the point here is that it should help people understand something. Right. But as it stands now, we don't know much. So I learned a lot by reading this paper. Um, And yeah, I kind of had the sense of like, oh, yeah, enlightening. I think maybe later we can get into like specifically how it could Mm -hmm. like interact with the research that we do. Um, But I just want to give a quick overview of kind of like the evolutionary progress that that he talks about. So basically, like as early as there were membranes encasing things, you had this kind of homeostatic urge because there's an inside and an outside world and you have to learn how to like interact with it. You have these negative feedback loops and stuff. He said neurons evolved around 800 million years ago at the border in multicellular organisms at the border between the inside and the outside. And they sense things and then also could control outputs. Um, And then, yeah, there were like two different groups of neurons, ones that were doing more of the sensing and like monitoring things like hunger, so to speak, mostly like nutrient density. Um, And they could send hormonal signals to other uh, cells in the body, including to other neurons that could then implement actions in response to that, such as locomotion or this like action of um, ingesting more water if there's nutrients around. Um, And he talks about how the first group of cells that were monitoring these levels went on to become the hypothalamus in in later animals. And um, the second group went on to become things like the hindbrain and the spirit colliculus. So, yeah, and so to get on to this, like, approach versus avoidance kind of circuits, I think he starts talking about that in the context of when 
eyes developed as two yeah. separate yeah. eyes on either side of the head, which I thought was really interesting. The idea is like if you want to avoid something, um, you want to move away from it. And when you have like you have an eye on each side of the head, if something is coming into your left eye, you want to move the right side of your body to get away from it. So that's why it's the case that like the left half of the brain controls the right side of the body because that leads for faster avoidance because avoidance needs to be very quick, whereas approach can probably be a little bit slower. So the approach system actually works on the same side of the body. I think it's the case that it like crosses over and then crosses back to control the same side of the body. So that's like clearly very distinct systems because they're like even controlling different sides of the body. So like certain inputs will activate the approach circuits that control the same side of the body and other inputs will activate the avoidance circuits which control the opposite side of the body. Yeah, and what I liked about this is that it's not just explaining how the behaviors develop but also how the circuitry that is specific for these behaviors develop in tandem with it like the what you were just saying about like the uh, contra versus ipsilateral um, control um, but also uh, then he talks about the idea um, that in the avoidance case if you have you have to kind of do a, an averaging so if you have um, two predators on either side that you want to avoid you can do the average and go in the middle to escape both of them but if you're talking about approach, if you have food sources on the right and the left and you go in the middle, you're going to have no food. Um, so there, like with avoidance, you have to kind of average and with approach, you need like a winner take all kind of mechanism. And so maybe that starts to explain like the kind of functional um, like segregation of different parts of the brain already. I don't know. I really liked that that part. It's something that just seemed very clear to me that hadn't before. Yeah, I agree. And throughout, there was a kind of a sense, it seemed to me that like, it would start that a few neurons that were already kind of part of an area started doing something a little bit different. And then in like the next round of animals, it was a whole new brain area, <laughs> which weirdly, though, kind of validates the functional localization approach to the brain, like the yeah. idea that different brain areas are doing different things, which was fashionable for a long time, but has kind of fallen out of fashion because things are more complicated than that. But like broad strokes, it does seem like that was the way things worked in evolution. If these bit of cells were like useful, they would like just become their own big glob of cells and be a brain area. But I guess the, the interactions uh, arise because the new brain areas in a kind of messy way that is evolved probably have interdependencies with existing brain areas. Right. So we've, like, I think this is you get these new modules, but these new modules are kind of messily, densely connected, at least in terms of functional interactions, either through hormones or, or connections with a bunch of the other things that are going on. It does seem, though, that like the way, um, well, the way I read it anyway, like the, the cortex or the neocortex seem to kind of escape this constraint somewhat, even in his story, where you have this, I forget how, I forget how it started, the cortex. I mean, it, I think he said that neocortex came out of the olfactory yeah. bulb, like the olfaction, and his hypothesis, probably not his, but like the hypothesis, is that um, nocturnal mammals were just using olfaction so much that that's the area that needed to be expanded for further processing. Yeah, and so, but I guess it it, it sort of has the attribute now of being like some sort of action map sort of um, thing where you just have... Uh, there's a certain state that you know you, the system infers, and it has a certain action that it does in response to that state. And there are different parts of the cortex um, represented, or well, that might be the wrong word. You know, you know. <laughs> I'll let you use it. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. not so. I mean, I it. actually can't think of a better word to use in that context. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, different action map states or whatever, and um, you can kind of understand why people who try to have general theories of cortex might sort of say, well, we don't really need to think about it as much as other systems in neuroscience. That's sort of how it evolved, really, because it is a bit more general. You're but, saying, like, because there are kind of repeated yeah, neuroanatomical exactly. motifs in the neocortex that we yeah. can't think of it as just kind of one thing that is good at processing a lot of different stuff. Yeah. Um, so I wonder how what other people thought, like, whether... It, it definitely seemed to me that, like, if you want to do systems neuroscience in general, like figure out how like basal ganglia, hypothalamus, and all this interact, you really, I'm definitely convinced by this that you need to like think strongly about how it evolved. But when you're thinking about like, you know, an algorithm for like cortical layers or something, is that as important there? Yeah, I agree that certainly in this review, it seemed like subcortical areas were more impacted 
by this kind of evolution like they were more impacted by evolution in a way or more designed in a specific way by evolution and it it did seem like neocortex just like and then there was neocortex (laughs) which given the fact that like in the field of neuroscience cortex is very heavily studied and thought of as so important it it really is it's downplaying it a lot. I don't know if that was just specific to this review, though, because he kind of well, mentions uh, at the end. Yeah, I think that this is intentional. I think yeah, yeah. De- de-emphasizing the part of the brain that people who are pumped up about <laughs> cognition <laughs> primarily care about is, yes, very much like kind of the spirit of this review, mm-hmm. um, right? It's that you there, there are a bunch of not necessarily ancestral, but foundational structures in the brain that are involved in sensor motor control and the neocortex is obviously but in a sort of more indirect way that is an ornament to to that and i think the claim is that cognition isn't this like isn't the whole of what the brain does or what humans do but it's it's a thing that is an elaboration of more fundamental processes that are shared across many animals right I think realistically, it's also just hard to to have this similar argument for neocortex um, because the examples that are given are are from very simple organisms yeah. uh, that have simple behaviors um, where you can kind of trace that delineation of different mm. circuitry, which isn't so. I mean, yeah. So there, I mean, there is there is an example which which uses um, uh, there's within class and outer class. Um, yeah. yeah. So. He, I mean, yeah, he does go on to talk about neocortex, and I feel like a lot of that was in the context of this um, affordance competition hypothesis. Yeah. So the idea of an affordance is that, like, in the world, you know, when you get sensory input, you don't just, again, you don't just faithfully represent the sensory input, but rather this, the idea of affordances specifically says that uh, you represent it kind of in conjunction with what you can do with it, with what actions it affords you. So when you see an object that you can eat that kind of has special affordances versus other objects, it really makes me think of video games because like sometimes there's background that you can't actually interact with and then there's objects that you can. And because animation is the way it is, usually the ones you can interact with look a little bit different. (laughs) And so it's like those ones have affordances and the static background doesn't have affordances. Um, But yeah, so this idea that these affordances specifically are in competition with each other. So you're getting a bunch of input, you have certain facts about your internal state, and it's like, what action are you actually going to do? These affordances compete with each other through the exact location where this competition takes place is not exactly clear, or it's dependent on what level of affordance you're talking about. Um, And then through that competition, an actual action is selected and and executed. Um, And so this was the context in which the neocortex was talked about. And how, uh, for example, he talks about different areas in the visual processing stream that represent visual information differently. Like there's areas that have a more kind of egocentric personal space representation. There are areas that represent more strongly the shape and orientation of an object. Presumably, if you're going to grasp it, you need accurate information on that. There are other areas that uh, represent things differently, like the area that is related to eye movements represents the world in a more retinotopic way, like a map. Um, So just this idea that, again, I'm using the word representation because I don't know how else to talk about it, (laughs) but there are different ways of processing the the perceptual information based on what you intend to do with it. So yeah, I I agree with this. And and because you and Jan have now both done this, I think it's worth interjecting and like just defending this usage of representation. Like, right. I mean, no, as as we, as we talked about earlier, uh, there, there's clearly a kind of connotation to some people of the word representation that it involves this sort of explicit or or like intentional representing of things like as though the system were designed to s- represent the symbols or like explicit stuff uh whereas the alternative is there's just like the in between in the sensor motor transformation and that in between uh right uh, like you can you can certainly look at it and and see that it's correlated with certain things or, or whatnot. And so, I, I mean, in the kinds of way you have you guys have both been using representation is that like somewhere in the transformation between inputs and outputs uh, from, from sort of raw sensation to action, there are, you know, regions that when you look at it, they do reflect 
uh, what's going on either in what you're about to do or in what you've seen or what you are sensing or have recently sensed. Uh, And that reflection of that stuff, I think it's reasonable to to just call unashamedly a representation. (laughs) He does make the distinction. Actually, both papers end up doing this. They're like, oh, well, I mean, you could call it a representation if you want. And he uses the phrase uh, in, in this paper of a pragmatic representation versus a descriptive representation. So I think descriptive representation is meant to be this like verbatim one that I don't know that anyone today really believes in. Well, um, I think I think yeah. cognitive yeah. scientists and psychologists frequently think about things this way. Whether whether they believe that the brain is doing this, they they, they certainly think of intelligence and, and the production of behavior in terms of the brain performing interpretable computations that align well with what perhaps an engineer would reason. Uh, well, I meant um, I think descriptive representation was really representing the world outside of you as it is, not mm, just representing useful wrong. concepts that we have derived as people trying to think about the world. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but I thought that's what descriptive representation meant. And then he kind of agrees that this other view of you process your inputs based on how you intend to use them, we could call that a pragmatic representation. I'm just like, OK, but we still say representation. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I perhaps this is a fine choice of of semantics. This maybe overloads the use of descriptive in a way that might clash with certain other usages. But I, I do think that this is a fairly standard view. I think there are many. I think like like I think most cognitive scientists and many psychologists w- would would think of the brain as explicitly modeling uh, what goes on. And maybe many neuroscientists don't think about it that way, only because kind of people are looking at at a, at a lower level of detail. I mean, but but certainly many cognitive neuroscientists who use kind of uh, human brain imaging as their as their primary mode would, I think, look to look at regions in the brain and, and think of them as, in, in some cases, you know, forming explicit models of what's going on outside or or uh, representing the state of the world or something like this. I think I mean that's true. And is this a good time to bring up Ramon Brett's paper? Uh, the coding metaphor of the brain. So it's like, is coding a good metaphor for the yeah. brain? Technically, we talked about an early draft of this in our episodes on the concept of coding, um, but it changed since then because that was a preprint and now it's published. But yeah, if you want to. Well, the exciting thing is that it's published in like this brain behavioral, uh, what's the journal? Brain brain behavior or something? Brain behavioral science? Yeah. Like that. <laughs> but they, that BBS they like, somehow. yeah, but they collect like responses that will be published uh, with then his response to the response to like I don't know twenty responses, but that I looked it up and it, it's not it's not ready yet. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be it's a good be fun. back and forth. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, no, I I think neuroimaging people sometimes they'll look for explicit representations of like the stimuli they present, but they also look for derivatives of that, like the value if you're doing a reward learning task or something like that, and that to me seems reasonable because that's like we've come up with some computational way to solve a problem and they're looking for components of that problem in the brain. But this this seems a little different to what I would think is more of the argument about representations, which is um, I would argue that representations of the external world exist throughout the brain um, partially uh, because the behavior constrains so much of neural dynamics. I'm thinking about this in a very motor control um, centric framework. Yeah, so I think this gets at a good point, which is not brought up in this paper because it's in the part of the paper that would kind of be beyond the scope, which would be like higher level cognition. It's like, I think what differentiates people who focus on the sort of sensor motor control from the cognitive science view is basically what they think the harder part of the problem is, right? So the people who are studying like low level sensor motor control think that engaging with the world, this is true, I think, for the way Roddy Brooks frames things as well, like is the hard part of the problem engaging with the world uh, in, in, in the way that you actually have to actuate a body in the world and kind of use raw sensory data? Or is the hard part of the problem figuring out how, like reasoning about the complexities of the world? And it's clear that like, I mean, certainly there, there do seem to be dramatic differences between many animals and certain other animals, including humans, in like how complicated their behavior can be, how prospective it can be, how much they can, you know, incorporate reasoning about experiences that they haven't had or had a very, very long time ago or experiences that other people have told them about. And we can do this because we can do some sort of complex reasoning that involves possibly building 
like more than implicit models of the world. So like a simple organism might do much of what it does based on kind of implicit modeling where it's it's not really modeling the world. It's kind of learning these associations kind of the way that I was saying like a baby might in a, in a simpler case where it's more like you you learn that you should do certain things because stuff in the world happens in a good way in response to that. But the more mature, cognitively mature version of that uh, is that you learn enough about the world to reason about what could happen in a way that's divorced from your own immediate actions. And it does seem to some extent like humans do this. We kind of have a subjective experience which aligns with us doing this. And this is why I think cognitive scientists think this is so primary, uh, mm -hmm. is that like uh, it, it seems like in humans, perhaps, contrary to this article, right? Like, uh, But I mean, I, I do agree with this article as well uh, in terms of its emphasis. Co cognition seems to rely upon something like an explicit representation, which is built up. And so whether you think that that's like innate in the sense that across so many animals, it was necessary to build this up, that evolution just kind of fashioned animals with a kind of innate ability to model the world or predisposition to model the world, or whether you think that that's learned due to experience, you might expect that complicated organisms do explicitly represent things as part of what, they, what they're capable of doing well. Well, that might be the most efficient way in order to produce like a system that's able to interact with the world in a yeah in a way that it can control it yeah. precise. And so that I guess that's the distinction between whether it's kind of in some way like meant to explicitly represent the world or whether it's a byproduct of like yeah. the ultimate loss function of evolution or something. So, so the cognitive scientist will come at it from the perspective that like yeah that's that's just I take it for granted that it's so obvious that humans at least represent the world explicitly because it's so advantageous. Whereas someone thinking more about sort of raw sensory input and the ability to sort of behave even at just a primitive level in the world might think those things seem less important to me than simply the ability to respond to the appropriate stimuli uh, and produce sort of temporally extended and, you know, coordinative behavior. Yeah, in the uh, Rodney Brooks paper, he is very clear on, like, it, it seems like he doesn't think, like, the actual problem solving, once you have the sensory information, is any challenge at all. <laughs> it's like, for him, the challenge <laughs> yeah. is getting your sensory information into a format that you can then do, like, simple problem solving on, which I agree, we don't, um, I don't feel like that aligns with my experience as a human, but he also makes the point that, you know, our experience, our like introspection is not actually a good guiding light for understanding how the brain really works because we don't actually know what our representations look like and we can't break down the, the process. We just have some experience of it. But I would say that it does seem plausible that higher animals maybe do devote a bit more of their brain to kind of just representing the world and then have multiple uses for that representation that become more specialized. Like in the case of vision or audition, it does seem like there are components of that system that it's the same few steps for a bit and then it kind of branches off into specialized use. And I think even in the Chisak paper, he makes reference to this idea for olfaction saying that like obviously it started as a way to to sense smells and get to like nutrients and things but then it can also be used for navigation and then that part of the brain like went off to become the hippocampus as well and so just this idea that maybe a, a, a complex creature that has enough to do might want a few stages of processing that are just kind of multi-purpose before it gets into this specialized thing for the action that it leads to but at the same time because evolution is not perfect there could be significant redundancy that like multiple regions, I mean, could be uh, overlapping in their function just uh, as a byproduct of the way in which they evolved. And it wasn't like very feasible for them to in, like interconnect with each other for some like physical reason. Oh, for reason. sure. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's an interesting um, thing to think about as well, because as I said, because neuroscientists aren't thinking about evolution all the time, I think maybe we do internalize the more lay notion of it as like, teleological or like being optimized like people yeah, talk about like you build models of the optimal way to solve a problem and then you see if the brain does it this that way these are like the, that's the normative modeling approach which in the Chisek paper he like explicitly kind of rejects as you can't do it that way because evolution isn't actually optimal it's highly kind of state dependent it's dependent yeah. on its past it can only do it can only make mutations that keep the animal alive while adding something like that's a very he frames it as a very restricted subspace and that's why 
uh, that's why you can't assume that evolution has optimized anything. And it's also why in his mind, it's a tractable problem to try to understand things in the light of evolution, because in his mind, it's actually a very restricted space that evolution can walk through. So knowing the state of the animal before will tell you a lot about the potential states of animals that come after. He, I mean, he discusses a few concepts, neuroscience concepts, and representations are are one of them. Um, but maybe a slightly more informative one to sort of like de- delineate the differences um, in, you know, evolutionary approach versus the standard approach is like just the decision making, basically, which I find to be quite useful. Where essentially, if you, you can you can look at a system and you can think, okay, you know, this animal is making decisions, and we have to build a system that you know. Uh, copies the way in which it's making decisions a certain way but um if unless you kind of look at the evolutionary history of that organism then you mightn't you might know that like you know the decisions between approach and avoidance and the decisions between local exploitation and exploration are actually two different circuits basically um that evolved in in different brain re- different brain regions basically so like it's just not a useful concept basically decision making i mean i think the idea of whether representation is a useful concept is up for debate but there are some concepts which you can actually look at and say, okay, from this point of view, it's actually not very useful to look at it through this lens anymore, basically. Yeah, so he basically presents at the end of the paper another tree of concepts that are based on how things emerge through evolution rather than these concepts that neuroscientists or psychologists have kind of come in and said, this is how we group things. So this is the alternative approach. And I agree that to call these multiple different things decision-making that take place in multiple different parts of the brain and are about different inputs and produce different outputs, I agree that it doesn't make sense to call that decision-making. I would argue though that if you actually analyze the literature on decision making in neuroscience like yes multiple different people call what they're studying decision making but i don't think they're cross-citing each other i think they actually cluster and they're already studying these things separately yeah and i think yeah presumably they would say of course i mean decision making in you know these kind of cortex or yeah in Um, this task or yeah yeah. but it's still i mean if you're taking like a neuroscience course or something maybe it's not so clear yeah that's true yeah it's not we're not presenting things in the optimal way at all that i definitely agree with (laughs) but like are we studying them in a way that roughly aligns with how he's dividing them i think we might be yeah yeah like this has long passed i just wanted to talk to you guys about the idea that jan put forth about cortex um you were saying that you couldn't imagine a way in which the cortex could not be doing some type of universal computation in a way because it it's so like sim- but it's really like not it's very heterogeneous if you look somewhere like visual cortex versus motor cortex like depends on who you ask the int- introductions to cortical talks are either this is super heterogeneous or like this is completely uniform yeah i'm as someone who works in cerebellum i have to say like okay fine cerebellum is way more regular and i still think that that is an issue in making that claim about cerebellum. Yeah. Also, the people who are saying that, are they theorists or are they well, experimentalists? They theorists, yeah, the well. theorists prefer to describe it as a repeating motif. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, think I, the data I, is a little complicated on that. <laughs> I also prefer to think that my theories are universal. So when you study cerebellum, though, like, do you, like, when you say that the cerebellum is extremely uniform, Uniform. Oh, I say that. Yeah, of course I say that. Okay, well, so but are you basing that on like you digging in and investigating that, like in the, under a mic? Like, what what is the evidence? Right, you might you might trust an anatomist on that specific yeah, question, yeah, yeah. either for cortex or for cerebellum. No, the but, circuitry like, is much more regular than in in the neocortex, and parts of the cerebellar cortical circuitry are like evolutionarily conserved over like four hundred million years, which is almost the entire time that there's been a cerebellum. Um, okay. Which, I mean, it's, it, but it's still quite heterogeneous in terms of the distribution of, like, you have some cells that only occur, like, in the middle of it and don't occur, like, more laterally. I don't know. Like, there, there are differences in the circuitry. Um, but I think it's, uh, anyway, I didn't mean to make this about cerebellum. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it kind of works either for the cerebellum or for um, neocortex that an alternative um, hypothesis is that maybe, like, uh, the circuitry was kind of, co-opted to do a different computation because it was kind of generic enough that you could change the weights a bit but still have this very similar structural connectivity and similar cell types and perform a completely different computation like something as different as having sparse um you know like local features in one part of it like visual cortex and then having some kind of like dynamical system generator in motor cortex yeah so my so my question is how useful then is knowing the phylogenetic sort of history of 
that cortical circuit because it's doing different things now. Um, so is it, I guess, I guess it probably still is useful. But then it is useful yeah. because then you see like which parts of the cortical circuitry like expanded compared to, uh, no, I think that that's what makes it useful. Yeah, I agree. Well, if you could figure out like when the different parts of cortex became differentiated, that could be useful in the same way that any of this has been useful. Um, maybe it's harder to study that. I have no idea. But yeah, can, maybe we should talk about how useful is this approach? What what do we learn from it? How does it interact with the existing approaches and make them better at all? I, as I said before, I felt like, oh, cool. Like, I feel better for knowing this. I feel somehow like I understand more. But at the same time, I don't think it's answering the same questions that I was originally asking. Like, if I want to know how does the brain do something? I want to know, like, this neuron connects to that neuron, and that leads to this, and these are the computations that this neural circuit is implementing and all of that. And I don't think that you get that directly from this approach. This seems to be connecting a lot of studies that took that approach through an evolutionary connection, which is cool. I guess the question is, would knowing the evolutionary tree better predict how the actual circuits are working in a situation where I don't know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think... So I think you're hitting on a good point, which is like, is this answering the question you're setting out? As a neuroscientist, you say, I want to understand how this circuit works. And this tells you this is where this circuit might have come from. But I think this is touched upon in the paper, which is that you, as a neuroscientist studying a circuit, having a more holistic view, understanding the context of that circuit is going to make you likely a, a better neuroscientist studying that circuit. And I, I mean, in some sense, that's the claim. The claim is just like you can you you got to, if, if you're a practicing neuroscientist, you might be studying some circuit because you went to grad school and your advisor was studying that circuit and you've continued to study that circuit. And at some point, probably 100 years ago, someone started studying that circuit because they thought like, oh, this is probably important for like the way animals do behavior. And every so often, every generation or two, I guess, it's probably worth reevalu as 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 is said in the paper. It's it's like worth reevaluating how the questions are framed. And I don't I mean this isn't a statement from the paper, but you can almost imagine that as neuroscience becomes more kind of industrialized, like as there are more professionalized neuroscientists who are in smaller niches, the sort of integrative view is a bit lost. Like the, the view that early 20th century neuroscientists had of looking at many parts of the brain and studying kind of the whole brain and how it produces the kind of stuff they're interested in, they could do that uh, because in some sense less was known and they could be less specialized. Uh, and the professionalization and kind of in pseudo-industrialization of neuroscience uh, perhaps encourages people to think about the problems more narrowly. And... Uh, I think this is a reminder to people who are studying specific subregions um, or specific circuits that thinking about it in the broader context can can actually be quite enlightening and help frame your questions better, even if you're interested in how things work. Is the answer to that to focus not on specific regions of the brain, but instead on specific behaviors that you can then trace through whatever circuits are necessary? Yeah, I, I, I do think that that is part of the correct response, right? Yeah, I think instead, like you shouldn't say, I study, I don't want to pick anyone because I know people who you study. You can say cerebellum, <laughs> I won't be offended. But, I mean, you, you, want, you want to say like, this animal does such and such. I'm interested in how this animal does such and such. But to be fair, that's the original view that he's railing against. Don't say you study decision making. You have to say, I study this actual type yeah, of decision true. in this animal, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess. No, well, I mean, the problem there is just because it's called decision making and there's lots of mm. decisions. But like, but yeah. studying a process, which is what people say that yeah. they do, is still correct. Yeah, Maybe. but I mean, so like, you know, there are there are examples of people who have perhaps done it right. Like Sten Grillner, who gets cited in this, you know, I think studies goal-directed locomotion, right? Which would be the kind of behavior that you can study in a kind of holistic and integrative way, right? You could you could say that as is the thing you're interested in. Or I study, you know, the act of grasping for food or something like this. I'm I'm, I'm picking ones. I mean, these are the these are the kinds of ethological behaviors. If if you're if you're not studying humans, if you're actually studying animals, you shouldn't be choosing to study something so kind of cognitively abstract as to be hard to operationalize, 
perhaps. Yeah, and you do kind of get this uh, like whiplash at the beginning of a lot of talks where the uh, intro slide will be like a relatable example of, you know, yeah. you're out in the world. In, in attention studies, a lot of it is first person video of Times Square. Like, ah, so much happens in the world. How do you focus? Uh, <laughs> and then the next slide is like, we use larval zebrafish. To, <laughs> it's like, wait a second. Are these things related? So definitely getting rid of that kind of nonsense of trying to relate disparate things or things that are too vague to even relate uh, at all. Uh, I'm, I'm pro that. So I agree that this is definitely an illuminating kind of, you know, read or whatever. But how do you actually incorporate observations from like phylogenetic observations basically into your neural models i mean you can bear it in mind okay like josh was saying but i mean the data we get is from you know in vivo mice or rats or something i think of it as not about at the level of modeling you're you're, you're that's too late right it should be in how you formulate your questions how you set up experiments and what you choose to measure and think about in the context of those experiments. What, so why can't you constrain your, your model? I mean, do, do you not think it's possible in some sense to do some sort of cross species or like almost like a simulated, you know, so, evol evolution of sure, a certain I mean, circuit, so right? that, That's like, that's going in all the way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Like yeah. For, for the average person who's not looking to like totally revamp their entire program to be like <laughs> just about how to evolve nervous systems, which is a cool research program. Uh, if, if you're thinking about more conventional conventional neuroscience, maybe part of the way you incorporate this way of thinking is in formulating tasks that you think are related to what the animal does, uh, that animal does in its ethological niche. Mm. Thinking about how the circuitry, the, the kind of things that like in some sense you should, it's, it's almost like, yeah, well, a good neuroscientist would already be doing this. So it sounds like kind of simple advice, but it's like, this is this is what the paper's saying. The paper's saying focus on evolution and make sure you're thinking about the brain region you're studying, how how it got to be the way that it is in the non evolutionary timescales, and when you're studying it, study it in the context of behaviors or tasks that are ethologically relevant because you're probably more likely to to, to see it. Now maybe maybe that's not the message. Maybe that's just how I'm. No, I I'm think you should that. just try to evolve your circuit. Okay, somehow. entirely. Yeah. The whole the whole focus of your research should be evolving it. <laughs> Yeah, more people should be doing it. <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts? I'll say I didn't actually care for the Rodney Brooks paper, the AI one. I thought a lot of his reasoning was confused, which is kind of surprising because in a way he was like he was coming on to several of the same arguments, like he ended up at them. But I just feel like he didn't do a good job. But I guess that paper was influential when it was written. But I was I was less than impressed by that paper. I, yeah, I agree. I didn't think the, uh, it was a little rambly, I guess. It didn't, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he had this whole metaphor of comparing it to um, a plane, like if you saw a plane before oh, aircraft yeah. was invented and it was, yeah, it didn't, it didn't land for me. Oh, Pun intended. <laughs> that was good. But uh, I mean, I, I think it does have to be recognized that the, the messages that he was communicating, many of them do anticipate the kind of things that we think are worthwhile in this uh, Paul Chusek article. Yeah. And I think they've been kind of wildly influential and drove the field in a productive direction. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, I'm using my modern eyes to judge the past, which isn't fair. I really liked the uh, the Chusek paper. Yeah, I liked it too. Um, I, I would go out and let me say it was probably one, it's the paper that I'm most excited to read. Even just reading the sort of abstract introduction, I was like, oh, I need to read this paper. Ah, cool. That was really okay, yeah, I, I thought it was liberating. Um, reading this paper because I don't know I, I uh, kind of had similar like but much vaguer ideas about evolution being important for how we think about uh, neural computation but then like anytime I ever kind of thought about evolution it was like well I'm never going to be able to figure that out that just makes it way more complicated but I really like the way that he describes it more as this can be a way to constrain um, our theories if we want to take uh, maybe a less dogmatic view of how different regions like what different computations are done in different regions and instead we have some constraints that we can use like this phylogenetic tree uh, in order to uh, to have like new theories yeah yeah it was pretty nice all right Sweet. till next time see ya <laughs>
Hey, if you're still listening to this, you must really like us. So how about you go to iTunes or Stitcher and rate the podcast? Give us some feedback. You can also go to our website, unsupervisedthinkingpodcast.blogspot.com. You can comment on different episodes, or you could give us ideas for new topics you want to hear about. We would love to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks.